Gods of the Dead have always gotten an unfair shake of things. Hades literally pulled the short straw and has been portrayed as a villain in almost every story he's been featured in ever since. Hell was abducted from her own home by the Aesir, locked away in the underworld and charged with the responsibility of maintaining it. But the Chthonic god who I think has been treated the worst of all is the Egyptian lord of the underworld, Osiris. Don't get me wrong, he was highly respected by the Egyptians and had cults all over the damn place, but the pain and trauma that he endured at the hands of his jealous brother Set make Courtney and Kim's feud seem like petty reality TV drama. Before we dive into Osiris' story though, and discuss his birth, life, death, rebirth, and death again, I think it's important to explain where we're getting our information about him because we have a limited number of trustworthy sources for Egyptian mythology. Like with a lot of other ancient cultures, this is partially because of ancient Egyptian society's reliance on oral storytelling. The majority of Egyptians were illiterate and believed the written word could change physical reality, so they preferred sharing stories out loud. As a result, the hymns and myths that archaeologists have uncovered don't have the same lavish details as many of the Greek writings that I've discussed on this show. They're basically the cliff notes, and because the Egyptians didn't have one definitive version of any myth, the person telling it could put their own creative spin on it. Now it turns out the vast majority of information we have on Osiris doesn't even come from Egypt. We have been able to infer some details from the pyramid texts and Shabaka stone, which were written in hieroglyphs, but the only extensive contemporary descriptions of Egyptian culture were written by Greek and Roman writers. The Greek author Plutarch's essay on Osiris and his wife Isis is our primary resource today because it's the most cohesive. But apparently he's included some details that are nowhere to be found in the few Egyptian sources we have. So I'll do my best to explain both without making it too confusing or contradictory. Now, first things first, we're going to play a little game called Who is that God and what does he do? Osiris was the name of Egypt's supreme god of the dead. I say supreme because he wasn't the only Chthonic deity. Anubis, Wepwawet, and Nephthys also served a function in the underworld but we'll talk about them in the future. Osiris was known as the king of the dead and the judge of the underworld. He was also considered a god of resurrection and renewal, so the Egyptians associated him with the Nile's yearly flood cycle that allowed their crops and vegetation to flourish. His domains also had a major influence over his depictions and art. He was usually shown with a pharaoh's beard, green skin, which symbolized rebirth, legs that were partially mummy wrapped, wearing a crown, and holding a crook and flail the tools of the shepherd. Osiris is part of the fourth generation of Egyptian gods. He was the firstborn son of the earth god Geb and the sky goddess Newt, and his four siblings were born on the consequent days. On the second day, Aruerus was born, who was associated with art, music, and poetry. On the third day came Set, a chaotic god who didn't wait to be born naturally and instead clawed his way out of his mother's stomach. On the fourth day, Isis was born, the goddess, not the terrorist organization. And on the fifth day, Nebuchadnezzar these arrived. Osiris and his sister Isis fell in love pretty much immediately after they were born. Actually, there's one tradition where they didn't even wait to be born to consummate their relationship. In other words, they banged while they were still in the womb, and some say their brother Aruerus was actually another name for Horus, the son they would have later on but more on him next section. In some tellings, Osiris also had a son with his sister Nephthys, but the story goes that he had mistaken her for Isis. And if you look at these comparisons of them, it's easy to see why. They're virtually identical outside of their hats. Nephthys has a house and basket on her head, while Isis has what appears to be a Hoover vacuum. Anyway, Osiris and Nephthys' child was a dog named Anubis, and he presided over the mummification ritual, he protected grave sites, and he guided souls to the underworld. He was a very good boy. So while the Egyptians believed Osiris was the king of the dead, he wasn't given that title or domain right out of the womb. According to Plutarch, Osiris was born to be a king of Egypt, and while he was king, he civilized humankind by teaching us how to cultivate land and grow crops, how to properly conduct ourselves so we can function together in a society, and how to honor the gods. These gifts he bestowed us are one of the several reasons he was seen as a god of vegetation first. His association with the underworld didn't come along for a few dynasties, which is probably why he went on an adventure or two before taking it over. You see, after establishing his kingdom, Osiris 
Cyrus went on to travel all over the world and used his natural charisma to make friends with every culture and creed he came across. Greek mythology buffs might recall a certain god named Dionysus going on a similar mission, making that three Greek gods who Osiris has some overlap with. The other two are Zeus and Hades, not just because of their unspoken sibling rivalry, but they were the kings of the overworld and underworld respectively, just like Osiris only his journey to the Chthonic crown was a bit more painful than Hades. Before we dive into that story though, I want to shout out our friends at Squarespace who are kindly sponsoring this episode. If you're launching a new business, starting a new hobby, or want a dedicated space to share your passion with the world, Squarespace has you covered. They make the process so easy and approachable from step one with their huge library of award-winning templates, intuitive design tools, and the fact that you don't ever have to download any software or patches. You can also embed videos, create VIP members-only areas to sell access to, and one of my favorite things Squarespace does is give you access to analytics that show you how much traffic you have, where it's coming from, and what people are doing while they're on your site. And that info goes a long way when growing your business. What I love and appreciate most about Squarespace though, is that I can trust them. They know how important it is for your website to function properly. So their award-winning customer support team is available 24 seven to get your issues resolved right away. So if you wanna join me and the thousands in our community who've benefited from using Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try them out completely free. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So the story of Osiris' death was one of the most popular stories in the ancient Egyptian world, and as a result, there were several versions of it. But the one thing they all have in common is that Osiris is murdered by his brother Set. Most versions don't give us a motive as to why, so some may assume that Set was jealous over Osiris being in charge. But the pyramid texts tell us that Set wanted revenge after Osiris hooked up with their sister Nephthys. Apparently Set had called dibs, and I guess that looking for love outside of the family is not an option when you're an Egyptian god. There's a number of ways the murder goes down too. In some tellings, Set takes the form of a crocodile or bull and tears Osiris' body to pieces. In another, Osiris is drowned somehow, but Plutarch's version has got to be the most brutal. In that one, Set organizes a group of 72 conspirators and they have a sarcophagus made custom to fit the exact measurements of Osiris' body. Then, during a party, Set had the beautiful coffin brought in and said that he would give it to whichever one of his guests fit it best. And now that I think about it, would a coffin that fits perfectly be the goth equivalent of Cinderella's glass slipper? Could someone who's goth let me know? Well, as previously mentioned, the coffin had been designed specifically for Osiris, and so the moment he laid down in it, Set slammed the lid shut and sealed it with molten lead. Then he threw the box in the river and it was carried out to sea. As soon as Isis gets word of her husband's death, she cuts her hair, puts on mourning clothes, and starts wandering through the land asking anyone and everyone if they've seen her husband's body, which is reminiscent of Demeter's search for Persephone as well as Freya's search for Odin. And while she's gone, Set takes over the throne of Egypt. I'm happy to report that she does eventually find Osiris' body. Depending on who you ask, her sister Nephthys and nephew Anubis may have helped her track it down, or she asked a group of children and they pointed her in the right direction. Either way, she learned the sarcophagus had washed ashore in the land of Byblos and it was able to stay hidden because either a tree or a clump of heather had grown around it. But the drama isn't over. For some reason, after Isis finds her husband's body, she conceals it in a thicket of reeds by the water. I'm guessing because she wasn't prepared to resurrect it yet. And while she left it unattended, Set came across it, chopped it into pieces, and scattered those pieces throughout Egypt. The exact number of pieces depends on your source. Plutarch says 14, but others have counted up to 42. Isis does manage to find and bury the majority of them, but there was one very important piece missing, his penis. She couldn't find her husband's penis. Legend says that Set had thrown it in the sea and some fish ate it. No, I'm not kidding. 
and Plutarch says it's because of this that the Egyptians didn't eat the Lepidotus, sea bream, or pikefish. At least that's the mythological explanation for abstaining. In reality, those fish caused hallucinations when eaten, laid toxic eggs, and were known for attacking people. But I guess those reasons weren't convincing enough to not eat them, so someone tacked on, they also eat dick, and everybody backed off. The good news is, Isis was able to make a replacement. I guess she had his measurements memorized. And after his proxy penis was buried, Osiris became fully formed in the realm of the afterlife. At least that's Plutarch's version. Other variants state that Isis sewed Osiris' body back together, and after being resurrected using powerful magic, he told her that since he had died, he needed to return to the land of the dead and become king there. As you can imagine, Isis was pretty bummed out about that, especially after taking all that time to build him a new trouser snake. But he told her not to worry. She'd soon be giving birth to a son who would dethrone Set and restore order to Egypt. That son's name was Horus, and the timeline for his birth is just as confusing as the timeline for his dad's death. Sometimes Osiris impregnated Isis before he got killed, and sometimes it happened during that brief window of time where he was brought to the land of the living. We'll talk more about that when we do a deep dive into Horus's mythology, but all you have to know is that Osiris was right. Horus and Set would have a number of epic battles, a pretty unsettling love affair, and a boat race, and in the end, Horus would be called the victor. So while he sat on the throne of Egypt, his father Osiris sat on the throne of the dead and the ancient Egyptians had some thoughts about that. It probably won't surprise you to hear that Osiris was an extremely popular god, not just in terms of being well known, but really loved and respected by his people despite his domain being such an uncomfortable one for humans to think about. Those who've seen my episode on the messed up origins of Hades might remember that the Greeks gave Hades nicknames so they could avoid saying his real name and attracting his attention. And when they made sacrifices to him, they would actually turn their faces away to avoid being personally identified. Even though they respected him, people just didn't want to be on too friendly of terms with the god of the dead. While the Egyptians had a slightly different approach, Plutarch does say that sacrifices to Osiris were gloomy, solemn, and mournful, but remember that in addition to presiding over the dead, Osiris also bestowed life with the annual flooding of the Nile that allowed the Egyptians to grow a new season of crops, crops that the myths say he taught them how to grow. In the beginning, Osiris gave mankind the knowledge to live their lives properly and then reunited with them after their lives had ended, and kings in particular were believed to become one with Osiris after they died, while their successor would be the embodiment of his son Horus. When it comes to the ceremonies honoring Osiris, they were held annually and in various places throughout Egypt. But the city of Abydos was his biggest center of worship, likely because one version of the myth stated Osiris's body washed up on its shores. But you could go to just about any city and find a monument that its citizens claimed was the tomb of Osiris. Supposedly, these tombs each contained a piece of the god that Set had chopped off and thrown across the land. Back to Abydos, every year for 1,500 years, the city came together to watch a theater reenactment of Osiris' death and resurrection. This took place at the end of every flood season, so January, and it lasted five days, with each day showing a different part of his story. And at the end of the play, there would be a funeral procession from the center of the city to Osiris' tomb. But the Egyptians weren't exclusively about the arts. They also appreciated their crafts. Another central figure of the festivals honoring Osiris was the construction of Osiris Garden. These were gardens that were placed in a mold that was shaped like Osiris. It was filled with dirt, grain, and water from the Nile, and the grain that sprouted from it symbolized Osiris' resurrection. Ceremonies and traditions like these were not only to show Osiris respect, but also to stay on his good side. There were even some real wealthy folks who had houses constructed along the funeral procession's route in the hopes that that would make them closer with the god. Now, the Egyptians' idea of the afterlife evolved over time. And I'll admit that I haven't done enough research to feel comfortable explaining it to you just yet, because I'm probably just gonna end up blending things from different dynasties together. What I do know though, is that when the dead person's soul passed their initial stages of judgment, whether that be at the discretion of the 42 judges or the ethereal scale where their heart was weighed against the feather of the goddess of truth, Osiris and Isis would joyously welcome them into their kingdom. If they failed their tests, their heart would be eaten by the goddess Amit, which, get this, caused their complete annihilation into a state of non-being. 
I don't even know what that means. So when you take that into account, it makes even more sense that the Egyptians worshipped Osiris so hard. Their options for the afterlife were blissful immortality with the possibility of rebirth and being obliterated into nothingness. I wonder which camp he would place you in for wearing those god-awful Osiris sneakers, which from the looks of it have gotten even uglier since I was in high school. I'm thinking eternal damnation, but what about you? Let me know in a comment or by hitting up Messed Up Origins on Twitter or Instagram. Also be sure to comment your thoughts on Osiris' mythology and which Egyptian god you want us to cover next. This is it everybody, the official start of Egyptian Mythology Explained. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, make sure you sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the algorithm gods, then follow Messed Up Origins on your favorite podcast platform so you never have to worry about missing an episode. I'll see you all again next week. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first. Thank you.